It's been a couple of months coming, but with Ruby's third volume on the way, and things all clear on my end, it's time to finally look back on its latest series with the Ruby Volume 2 retrospective. It's my first attempt at doing anything like a full season review, and before we start, keep in mind that this video will contain opinions. These are my thoughts and feelings, both positively and negatively, on this recent volume in various points like the story, the writing, the characters, and so on. Some points you may agree or disagree with, but I say and feel them because in the end, I want the show to be the best that it can. So please understand, while I do love the show, I am going to be critical in this review. And if you have your own thoughts and feelings, you can share them or discuss points that I make down in the comments. Also, before we properly begin, I'm guessing you watching this wouldn't be doing so if you didn't actually watch the volume since, you know, this is my summary of it, and going in blind means that you'll be heavily spoiling yourself. Either way, you'll get the best out of this retrospective if you have seen the entirety of Volume 2. With that being said, let's finally kick it off with chatting about the story. Welcome to Tuxin's Book Trade, home to every book under the sun. Gonna start off with a bit of a negative tone, as for as much as what went down this volume, not much changed in the grand scheme of things. The villains still have their plot moving forward, despite a big portion of it being rushed and ultimately being thwarted. The Ruby Girls are still looking to stop it, despite not knowing their true base, who's actually the cause of it all, nor the plans whilst they're still going through their beacon lives with the other friends. And many other plot points have been taking some steps forward, but some have been teasing for the future, leaving current storylines and characters involved frozen waiting for those incidents to come. In other words, the status quo wasn't changed. It to me just felt like the story progression definitely hung on the volume being at the end of the introduction portions of some characters, parts of the world and the story itself from the series opening volume, and the real thick of things with the major plot at hand coming into play when we expect to see it in volume 3 a plot we already knew was forming come the end of Volume 1. It's a consequence, I feel, of the show balancing a looming black cloud in the shape of the villain's plot, with several subplots and hints to more to come, on top of introducing these characters fully at a slow pace. It's not the worst approach a show can take, but it's one with traps and stumbling blocks. The plan and the brains behind it were caught off guard with the train's early use, but it's still moving forward, almost like the failed train and the Grim invasion mattered little, despite involving a horde of Grim, a heavy amount of White Fang members, Dust, and Mechs, and a citywide target, with the team coming out of it also seemingly losing a vital member to prison. We also still don't know a thing as to Cinders, Romans, Emeralds, or Mercury's reasons for why they're doing this and why they're working together for it, or ties between them, nor anything about them beyond the plan. Really, the only villain's reasons we know of are the collective of the White Fang, which we knew already early on is a case of them resorting to a violent manner to Fauna's prejudice, albeit due to a new leader's decision to take this route. But then, on the other hand, we don't know why they too are a part of Cinder's faction for the plan. The fact that such a rather destructive part of the plan ended up being brushed over so easily and is still counted as a success can make fans wonder, yes, what are the positives from this outcome and what can they still be planning that such a big fumble isn't a big deal to them, but also, well, damn, that kind of makes what I just watched feel a tad pointless, even though it was pretty freaking epic. Okay. I wasn't asking for the plan to be foiled, it's definitely big enough to last longer than up to this volume, but we're at a good enough amount of episodes to now where I possibly would want the who, why, when, and what's of it all, if only a little. We did, however, this volume get Ironwood's introduction, opening the door to more than just the Kingdom of Bell's reaction to these actions. Now we got a contrasting opinion from someone that matters, one whose opinion can have a large-scale effect on the world, and he does indeed clearly have a different way of doing things 
and has a different mindset that's already bringing up conflict amongst the good guys. This new face, in the meantime, opens the effects of the villain's plans out to more than just being a Vale-related incident. The Kingdom World of Remnant episode mentioned that if one kingdom fell, it would have a lasting chain effect on all the kingdoms. So it's good that we do have a non veil related representation involved to make it feel like it is this big risk, while events are still taking place in Vale for the time being. Imagine for example Team Magma or Team Aqua's plot only had its effects shown through how it affected say, Little Root Town, but not Hoenn as a whole or the world. The more different parties reacting, the more of an effect it brings via more people affected by it and more cause for our heroes to combat it, as well as people with differing beliefs, tactics and opinions working for the cause, creating plot points like Ospin and Ironwood's differing ideas on retaliation, causing rifts that has led to their relationship seemingly being torn, and Ospin's headmaster role at risk. So I'm glad that we got Ironwood's introduction making this more than just a secluded issue. It makes sense given that the matter clearly has effects on more than just Vale, and includes the situation regarding the Faunus discrimination, and involves also the next generation of Huntsmen and Huntresses. Now we did get some entertaining character focus scenes, and I'll go more in depth with them character by character later on, but I will say, even with a lot either left in the dark or hinted for later relevance, I did like how the volume was directed and paced in terms of its main plot and the side stories. For starters, while episode 1 had the gang involved in the Great Food War of 2014, really for the sake of being a big welcome back to the series, I'm glad that it took just the following episode for them to start refocusing on Torchwick and the White Fang. If the volume waited an episode longer and had the girls doing something else that really didn't affect things, it would have slowed down the pace of an already limited volume, when it needed to kick right back in. So props there. There was also the major plot stepping back for character focused plots like the relationship and growth of Jean and Pyrrha, or Blake's stress, and the dance taking place, and I think that the show balances its focus fine, especially around the midway mark. Main plot elements and moments feed it nicely into each other, with other plot points such as Cinder's group taking steps of their plan during the dance, which housed the big moment between Jean and Pyrrha. And it's good that as much as we get of the team's bonding and spending time with each other, growing stronger as a unit, and working on their issues within their ranks, we also got more of them with their issues and challenges with other characters outside of their teams such as Ospin and Blake's discussion involving Blake's race and Ospin starting to place himself as more of a present eye over their actions, as well as Ublek aiding his students with understanding beyond their personal reasons about being a huntress, as well as Penny and Ruby finally getting into the details of the robot girl's true identity as well as Ruby's stance on it. It was moments like that in Volume 1 that I rather enjoyed, and it's great that this trend carried on. No sense such moments have to be relegated to a Team Ruby or a Team Juniper members only matter when the cast is this big. In fact, for as much as the show is no doubt known for its action, the insane weapons, the music or its shippings, this story is still very much about the characters. Hell, most of the people's favourite episode of this volume had no fighting in it at all, and had some of the volume's biggest character moments. And hopefully these sides shown should lead into the next volume feeling like Okay, we know now at least a good handful of people beyond a brief premise of them. Now let's see how the major plot, once fleshed out, will impact them when it has an effect. Though there are some faces I would like to see get some more attention, more on that later. Also, side note, while we did get a lot more information on the Grim that makes them a bit more interesting than, say, a token beastie the hero slay like the putties from Power Rangers, even with the finale episode set up, it did feel a bit to me like they're still too weak for the ever-looming threat that they're being touted as, especially when the only Grimm shown outside of the city was the patient kind. Team Ruby managed to hold on decently enough to begin with, despite just coming out of a crash against this invasion of Grimm in the city, and Coco's minigun moment of awesome wiping out several Grimm like she was shooting through wet tissue paper, it just seemed a bit 
anticlimactic after the wonderfully gripping conclusion it was given the episode previous and basically being built up for three episodes and a World of Remnant focus. Considering the only victory we've seen for Grimm was the already fallen Mountain Glen, I'd like to see more examples of the Grimm still being an equal, if not more deadly force that warrants the existence in the first place of Hunters and Huntresses. To end this segment, three final points. The show and the story's pacing benefited greatly this time out, having episodes with a consistent longer episode run length than Volume 1. Point 2. Couldn't the scene with Raven and Yang at the end be best saved for the next volume, and not be possibly touched on as quickly as it did after the Mystery Woman's debut? And lastly, about the tone. The volume opened with the first body to hit the floor and not get back up. Tuxen living was a risk to the villain's plans, and thus they off him. Well dang, that's pretty dark, and it's saying that the villains will do anything to make sure that their plan goes off smoothly and any deserters won't get a chance to possibly squeal. Did it mean that the volume was going to have a darker tone? Well, not really, and not in the sense that most people kind of thought. The only other death would be any White Fang members following the train fight, the crash, or any of the incoming Grimm, or any of the unmentioned civilian deaths when the Grimm did make it inside the city. But that's left either to a single line, or not touched on, and the death count of any real possible impact still ended up being a light one, Tuxen. Kind of a tone whiplash, but if that wasn't the intention in the first place, I'll at least have that as a passing mention on the side. So yeah, the story's probably cemented in for me this volume as a bit of a mixed bag, with some shiny moments to at least not make it a boring or terrible ride. Again, the status quo being largely unshaken, and such things as the bad guy's plot being no clearer than when it was at the start, especially in terms of the reasoning and other plot points being saved for the future, with present day only really getting small bites, it did make it feel like in terms of the story, not much was gained, but in terms of giving some characters time to show off more about them, it was definitely decent. And overall, it's nice that we are actually looking to be going somewhere now, if not slowly. The introductions for the vast majority are done, so it's now time for that black cloud to finally start to hover over us. Just maybe a tad more faster next time, please? I'll give Volume 2, in terms of its story, 3.5 out of 5. <laughs> Pretty sneaky, sis. But you just activated my trap card! Now, I'm gonna be honest. While I can give the story some passing praise despite its hiccups, the writing, I feel, is equal parts a weak point this Volume 2, with some of its own bright sparks at least to help it keep above the water. For the good, the volume showcased that the writers are continuing to write the characters fitting to their personalities. White is still written more refined and confident than the clumsy, lacking confidence and lower standing Jean. Sun's showcased as the chilled, carefree dude, but the equally chilled Mercury is more sly with his opinions and yet equal parts blunt. Cinder's written with that distinctive, attractive flavouring to her words as she plots, while Ironwood's written just like the sort of experienced, authoritative mind that fits to name a few examples. The characters are written exactly the way that their personalities and role feel like they should, and they rarely feel any different without a cause. Yang still felt like Yang in that scene with Blake here, despite her talking about her tragic past. The effect it had on her was very clear, while she was also trying to explain its importance for Blake's sake. And Pyrrha still felt like the same girl, despite finally lowering down her shield and taking some stress off her shoulders. And characters like Nora, Roman, and Ublek just never really failed to hit the mark with what they got to say. The writing in terms of the humour is as you expect from Rooster Teeth too, and it's this and the familiar character side of writing that definitely feels the volume strong point in terms of writing. Whereas when it comes to writing around events of the plot and some other side stuff, it's where it starts to feel more shaky. As mentioned before, Cinder's group and her plans, and all the reasoning, haven't been mentioned or at least touched on, and it's one of the things that gets a lot of being teased. And while it does draw the viewer in as we try to pick apart what they say to try and find some clue to the future, it's been a lot of their dialogue outside of when they're trying to mask themselves as students. 
really some of the best lines for them comes through the first episode, where we got a banter between Emerald and Mercury showing off their hot and cold relationship, despite still being shown convincingly as an effective duo. Cinder was as soothingly alluring, teasing and definitely commanding as all hell, and honestly, Roman's the only one out of that group that had something interesting in that volume and continued to do so, having entertaining dialogue on a constant basis. Though I will be fair, there's also the fact that the most of them weren't as frequently used as Roman. There are some good story and world-based writing too. Ublek was the voice box that gave some great life into the locale that was Mountain Glen, and we ended up with a place that felt humanized. It had a past as a prospect for the future safe haven that ultimately failed to a major effect. A present, where it's the merger of the White Fang's train plot base and the home for a large horde of Grimm, and it has a future as Ublek touches on as an example of the mistakes made in the world that people can learn from, and thus usable knowledge for saving lives. That's great writing that uses the past events of the writers that they formed outside of the present events and mixed it into future events to come, making it feel like a world that's lived before the present day for the story when it comes to the location of the episode events. Earlier before that, we also had the very creative idea of using a board game of all things as a means to not only add to the science of a tighter union between Team Ruby's members on top of those of Team Juniper and Sun, but also the introduction of a new face into the circle, adding to support for Blake's anger over the attitude and lack of actions against the White Fang from her friends, and even on top of that, giving some subtle hints into the various worlds, kingdoms, nature, and traits that's not forced in via an information dump that's not fitting for the current situation. With this one scene, we ended up knowing Blake's edging a tipping point, Team Juniper is in the know about Blake's secret, Sun's still holding a good interest in Blake be that romantic or just friendly, Neptune and Weiss start to form a quick interest in each other at Jean's expense, with repercussions from that for his relationship with Pyrrha, all the while we also see that Weiss isn't being as cold as she is with her team previously, and we learn all this about the various kingdoms, all in what's mostly used as a comedic scene before the dramatic moments of the next scene of the episode, and I tip my hat for them for that. That's a lot of good accomplished in what could have been seen as a throwaway scene. And one other neat bit of world building that came from the very same episode was the mention of entrance exams and combat schools not being the only way to get into schools like Beacon, therefore making sense as to how someone with seemingly no school training like Blake got in via her skills gained from White Fang duties and living outside of the kingdoms, and how Jean could get in based on just fake papers, though knowing Ospin, he still could have got in being based on him seeing some prospect in Jean, but it does clear up that little foggy issue. That being said, the writing's fumbled at times too. There's been a handful of inconsistencies for one, like Ospin incorrectly claiming that Ruby was at Junior's dance club because of the rose petals cited there, and while you could see it as being something for the fans waiting for it, in the world of Ruby at least, the context of Velvet building up using her weapon and being told to save it is a bit out of place without an in-world context as to why she's built it up for so long despite being seemingly a year above the other students, though I'll admit that's a bit of a nitpick. Same for my past mention of Ruby using the Force score, I have a dream and I'm not a crook phrases of our world when it has no real standing in theirs, unless I have a dream was used by a Faunus but that's beside the point. Then we have the sequence between Jean and Neptune at the dance, which in the past did bring up a lot of negative reception from some watchers, as it could have been seen as coming across objectifying Weiss. I said in my review of that episode that I know that wasn't the intention, and I'd be shocked if it was, but it's an example of how some smoothing out needed to be in the scripting to make sure that lines feel natural, but also carry out its intended purpose and not confuse it for another. In the end, if I were to categorize the writing by say, emotional, informative, foreshadowing, character specific and comedic, 
it would have a bit of a mixed grade sheet. Hopefully with the possible route the story is taking, and the writing team getting more familiar with the style they need, it should get tighter. But yeah, the writing for me is the sanction of the show that I think needs a lot more work on. For me, it gets 3 out of 5. Get back in the bag. <laughs> now, I separated the humour from the writing portion because one, it's including visual humour too, and two, to admittedly not weigh it down by some of the negatives of the writing as a whole, because I think that the humour in Volume 2 was a very strong success, and I find myself laughing even more than I already did in Volume 1. The in-jokes will always get a good chuckle out of me as a fan of Rooster Teeth, though now that we've got official word of a Japanese dub via Warner Brothers, I do wonder how such jokes will be adapted or used in that version. But back on track, the other written jokes and light-hearted moments carried well amongst some of the more somber and serious moments. Nora and Roman are two characters whose varying tone of humour is always a delight, and it went tenfold here, adding to them both being high in my favourite characters list. And for as much as the writing team may have stumbled over some other points of its work, they hardly left me without at least one good chuckle in an episode. The visual humour is top stuff too, even if it's just the smallest of moments, and it's nice that it seems to be a stemming from a lot of the animators and the team just really adding in different inputs into the show, so it's not just one person or the writing team's idea of humour. The humour's just been solid throughout, and even with some jokes being more, oh god that's stupid, than anything, it's less a joke not hitting, more so the lameness of the joke, and that ends up being a joke in itself. Noteworthy jokes for me include Weiss thinking sons of peeping Tom, all of Ruby's very anime styled reactions, Nora breaking the tension here, women, and admittedly this from Jean. I promise not to sing. I lied! I give the humor 4.5 out of 5 stars.